things that, that he wanted to do with his power to save the world. But he chose you and I to be his hands to the world. We are, look at somebody tell him, we are his hands. We are his hands. So I want to look at just a minute. First of all, we've got to understand, and we understand through the word of God, that God is not a hateful God. God is not a hateful God. Some people's God I would not want to serve. Some people, the way they project God or they perceive God, I would not want to serve. He said in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Have you ever known anybody like this? They think God is just sitting up in heaven waiting for them to mess up. I knew you would. God just sitting up in heaven on his throne with a royal lightning bolt, waiting on you to mess up so he can strike you down and strike you out and take you out. That's a lot of people's perception of God. Look at somebody and tell them God's not hateful. A lot of people only know the wrathful God, the mean God. But what Jesus said he wants us to understand is he loves the world. So much of what happens to us, is not a result of what God does to us. It's a result of the choices that we make. But yet we'll blame God. Why did this happen to me? Why did God do that? God didn't do this to me. A lot of it is the choices that mankind makes. And it's not what God does. And a good example of this is in Luke 15 and verse 13. The Bible talks about the prodigal son. A man had two sons. The younger said, give me that portion of goods that falls to me. And so he said, uh, uh, not many days later... The young man gathered everything together and went on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. And he began to be impoverished. It was not the father that caused him to fall into hardship. It was the choices the son made. Why is God doing this to me? A lot of it we may not can help. God knows I have understood that over the last year. But there are some things we can help, and we can't blame God for the choices mankind makes. We can't blame God. And so the young man, the Bible said he went away and spent everything that the father had given him. He wasted it on, on riotous living, on, on, on wasteful living, squandered it. And then he made choices that when hard times hit, he had nothing to fall back on. You, we can't blame the father for what happened through the son's choices. And a lot of the stuff that we can change, God God said it didn't say that he would fix everything in our life he just said he'll take care of what we can if we take care of what we can let's say that again i got the cool cool. he said he will do what we can't do if we do what we can we can't sit home in a recliner and and ask god to fix our problems we got to say god i'll do what i can do but i need you to do what i can't do God, I'll do everything in my power, but when I've done all in my power, I need you to do everything in your power, which is greater than my power. Amen? Amen. So we can't blame that on the Father. The Son knew the truth about what was really going on in his life. Look at verse uh, Luke 15 and 16. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger? I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. When he came to his senses, I think the King James says when he came to himself, when he woke up, let's put it like this, when he decided to stop blaming everybody else, when he looked in the mirror and said, you know what, it's not his fault or his fault or her fault, it's me. If I'm going to get up out of this mess, I'm going to have to make up my mind, I'm going to get up out of this mess. So I just came to tell somebody this morning, God loves you. He loves you. But he's not going to pick you up out of the pig pen that you can get up and walk out of. He's waiting on you to come to your senses and say, you know what? Why am I settling for this kind of life when God wants me to have the better life? God wants me to have the better life. Somebody say it with me. God wants me to have the better life. He came to himself. He stopped blaming everybody else. We live in a blame game world, don't we? You know, the reason why I killed those 20 people is mama didn't buy me crayons when I was three. Well, you know what? When you were three, you had an excuse to blame it on mama. Now you're 30. You can go buy your own crayons. 
It's time to stop blaming and looking to everybody else to save us and looking to everybody else to fix it and stop blaming all our problems on everybody else. It's time to come to yourself. It's time to look to yourself. Hey, I've got to shake myself and say, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm sick and tired of this. Much like the drama they showed us. I'm tired of chasing this and chasing that and chasing that. It's time to come to myself and say, you know what? I'm going to be better than this. Look at somebody and tell them I can be better than this. you got to stop looking around. Stop blaming God for what God had nothing to do with. Stop playing the blame game. So he's not a hateful God. Number two, he says he is a loving God. Verse 17, he did not send his son in the world to judge or condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. It's not that he wants to punish the world. He didn't want to punish the world. He wants to punish the things that afflict the world. He doesn't hate sinners. He hates sin. Why does he hate sin? Because it is a cancer in the soul of man. Sin is a cancer in the heart of man. And he hates sin because sin is contagious. And so God loves us. He's a loving God. He, does, he, wants to, he has to punish sin but not people. The, uh, one version says he, he, does, he replaces the word judge with condemn. To judge against or to sentence or to condemn. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. God's not waiting for his opportunity to punish you. He's waiting for his opportunity to forgive you. Oh, no, no, no. I got I to gotta do that a little better, a little better. Let me give some running room. He's not waiting for an opportunity to punish you. He's waiting for an opportunity to forgive you. But, Pastor, you don't know what I've done, and you don't know what I've said, and you don't know where I did it, and you don't know who I did it with. I don't, it don't matter. God's not looking to punish you. His desire is to forgive you. Stop uh, punishing yourself. You know what? You need to come to yourself. You need to forgive yourself. Well, I wasted 40 years. I wasted 50 years. I wasted 60 years. That's all right. God can handle it. Oh, the blood. The blood can handle it. God wants to rescue us out of our bad choices. He wants to remove us from the guilt of the past that we've been through. He wants to. Some people think you got, oh, I got to beg God. Oh, God, please, 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 please. That's not, that's not what God's will is. He said, I'm waiting, just like the, 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 the drama they did. I'm waiting with outstretched arms for you. I want to forgive you. Let's go back to our story about the prodigal son in Luke 15 and 20. So he got up, went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. One version says, and fell on his neck and kissed him. Can I tell you, God's not waiting to punish you. He's waiting to forgive you. Now, I'm not just talking to folks that's got, uh, had a bad night, a bad weekend this weekend. I'm talking to some church folks. It's time to forgive yourself and get past that and move on. He's not a wrathful God or a hateful God. He's a loving God, a father who wants to forgive us so much so that he gave his only begotten son, his only son, to die for us. But you know, that's just the way God works. He loves us so much he gave his one son for us. But look how many sons he reaped from the seed he sown. Every saved person becomes a child, and it's not just an only child anymore. He didn't ask, the, the father in the story didn't ask any questions about, you know, I know I could see myself if, if I'd given half of my belongings to, our, the, to, to one of my children and they'd gone away for months and come back in rags and, and broke, busted, and disgusted. You know, I don't know about you, but I'd be like, where's my money? <laughs> you, 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 you left here with my money. You left here doing good. You left here fair and well. Now you're on welfare. Where are my money? I'd like to think I'd be like this father and not worry about it, but come on now. How many honest folk we have in the house? I worked hard for that money, and it's gone. You blew it just like that. You know, we all know people that can blow money pretty good. Father didn't mention money. He didn't talk about how he was dressed. He didn't talk about how he smelled coming out of the pig pen. He fell on him and kissed his neck and said, My son that was dead is alive again. Can I tell you, God, God don't want to talk about your past. He wants to cover your past. He don't want to talk about where you've been and what you've done. He wants to cover it. That's what the cross is all about. Yesterday's passed away. It's gone. We must, 
You know, kind of like the girl I was telling somebody about before service, telling Hannah about it. The girl that she went to church as the preacher preached on a fresh start, a new start. So she got on Facebook and she said to all my friends, I just want to let you know that I made a new start. I'm forgetting the past. The past is over. It's done. I'm, today's a new day. I'm moving from this day forward. So if I owe you money, <laughs> it's in the past. Forget about it. It's over. <laughs> God wants to cancel your debt spiritually. He's not going to ask you about it. He's not going to make you give account for your past. He's not going to make you give account for what you did in your past days. He's waiting there. And lastly, he's got a love that keeps us. Not only does he receive us, his love keeps us. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? <clears throat> if God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? When the enemy tries to bring up your past, you have to remind him, I'm not that person anymore. I'm forgiven. You know what I wish somebody just say to me right now? God loves me. Say that. God loves me. Turn to two people and tell them, God loves you. Come on, tell them, God loves you. Tell some folk, God loves you. Because see, some folks are not, they don't realize that. They don't understand that. God loves you. He loves me. I, God loves me. He's not waiting to punish me. He loves me. If you leave this here today, and, and every time you see an egg, since Easter's the egg's trying to replace the cross, and the rabbit's trying to replace Jesus, every time you see an egg and a rabbit, I hope you think about how much God loves you. <laughs> You go to the grocery store, and you're going down the, 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 what is it? Where's the eggs at? On the dairy aisle? Okay, okay. We get our eggs out in the backyard, so. You're going down the dairy aisle in the, gro the grocery store, and you look over there and see the eggs stacked up, and you say, oh, glory to God, hallelujah. Someone said, what's wrong with you? The price of eggs gone down? No, God loves me. He loves me so much. Come on, somebody. Uh, every time you think about it, you start thinking about how much God loves you. God loves me. He loved me that he gave his only begotten son. And the devil starts trying to tell you, oh, you can't get past this. This is going to get you. The devil's a liar. God loves me. God loves me. Come on, somebody say it again. God loves me. Come on, say it with conviction. God loves me. God loves me. I tell you what, let's read this one. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in. Love. See, we try to get rooted and grounded in how good we can be. We try to get rooted and grounded in who we follow and which church we go to and what denomination we're in. That won't root or ground you. Rooted and grounded in what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that I loved him, but that he loved me. Let's read on, read on, read on. I get ahead of myself. Rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend, oh man, with all the saints, what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. Can I tell you this morning, I could preach from now till this time next week and could not express to you the, the length, the depth, the height, the width of how much God loves you. As a matter of fact, oh, I feel it coming on now. Eric, you left a little bit up here when you got through, sir. I feel it coming on now. Philip left a little bit up here when he got through. I feel it coming on. I, there's, if I preach from now to the rest of my... Now, don't get nervous. I'm not. <laughs> Somebody said, you, feel, you know, just, just because you preach on eternity don't mean it has to be that long. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. But I could preach from now to my last breath comes that I could not express to you the measure of God's love for you. That's what Paul said, that we may some way comprehend the length, the depth, the height, the breadth, how much God loves you. That's why I can be rooted and grounded in love. He loves me. He loves me. So anyway, I gotta, I gotta, I, I'm not to my point yet. To know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with the fullness of God. He said, I want you to be full of the love of God. Not that I loved him. You know what? I didn't love him. I didn't know how to love him. 
Before God, I didn't know how to love anybody but me. Well, I, I got two or three people know what I'm talking about. Before I knew God, I didn't know what love was. This world doesn't know what love is. Love is not liking the way you make me feel. Love is not that little warm and fuzzy. Can I tell you, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, I doubt he was having the warm and fuzzies for us. Eric told us starting out. He, we were on his mind, but it wasn't because he was feeling the warm and fuzzy. You know, oh, you know, when you fall in love, can't eat, can't sleep. We had one guy tell us, you know, when you first fall in love, you could just eat each other up. And after you've been married a while, you wished you had. <laughs> Get indigestion or something. Not everybody can have a relationship like ours. I still have the warm and fuzzies. She walks in the room and I just... I sit here on Sunday morning waiting on her to get here, just looking out the window like a little 12-year-old, waiting on her to get here. But love is a choice because not every day is felt that way. <laughs> now, not in our relationship, but some relationships. <laughs> You've been married a while. You could bury them in the backyard and go out every morning and dance on their grave. <laughs> now, that don't last. We, we ain't got a whole, well, I need to preach on honesty this morning is what I need to preach on. Because I see men going, mm, not me. And I see women going, mm. <laughs> go to bed with my dancing shoes on. I mean, no, that's not love. Love is when you say, you know what? I'm with you is regardless of how I feel. I'm with you regardless of how you make me feel. Love is not a feeling. Love is a choice because Jesus wasn't feeling it on the cross. He chose it. And he loves you. Not because of your behavior, because he loves you. Come on, mamas. How much you love that baby at 3 o'clock in the morning when it smells funny? <laughs> you got the flu or something and it's screaming his head off wanting to be fed and don't care how you feel, you still love it. You may be wondering why you did it, but you still love it. Oh, I'm getting some honest people up in the house now. I got mamas getting whiplash. Well, let me just tell you. Let me give you mamas that got little babies. Let me give you some hope about where you are right now. They'll be 13. Um, even God didn't want a 13-year-old daughter. They turn 13, you call NASA and say, get rid of your computer. I got somebody that knows everything. You don't even need a computer. <laughs> love is not how we feel. Love is a choice. God chose to love us. He chooses to love you, not because you're doing the right thing right now. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can I just show you? Getting ready to close. Go ahead, guys. Get ready to come on up. Can I just show you <clears throat> the love of God? My wife, we were watching, what were we watching? The Jesus, Son of God. <clears throat> Wonderful movie. It's on Netflix if you want to watch it. It's a good movie, The Son of God. A lot better than probably what a lot of stuff on there. But one thing that we were very impressed with on that, even when, when, when Jesus was under the weight of the cross and they got Simon to come and help him carry the cross, he looked at Simon and smiled to comfort him. In the garden, he reached down and picked up the high priest servant's ear and healed him. He was about to face the hardest 24 hours of any man's life, and he healed a man's ear. Not his heart, not something life-threatening, just his ear took the pain away. He was hanging on the cross, and the one thief said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Now that's love. In the midst of your pain, you can still comfort somebody else. In the midst of your troubles, you can still care about somebody else. I, I, I still, am, when I discovered something, I, and all the time of preaching, 
about Joseph when he was put in prison and stayed in prison for about 10 to 15 years of his life. For, he was innocent, but stayed in slavery in prison for 15 years of his life. And the Bible tells us that one day he saw two prisoners who had just come into prison whose countenance was falling. They were just mad looking or sad looking. And Joseph said, what, what's wrong? Why are, you, why are you sad? Why are you upset? And they said, well, we had these dreams. And, and, we, and he interpreted their dream. In his suffering, his injustice, he ministered to somebody else. But it was his ministering to somebody else that got him out of his prison. Can I tell somebody this morning, it may be you're loving somebody out of your hurt. It may be your demonstration of love to someone out of your hurt. It may be your door opening to get out of it. If you'll come to yourself and say, you know what, I'm not going to blame everybody else. I'm just going to realize I've got to do better. And you start, start making it about other people, that maybe that'll be the door opening for you to come out of your hurt. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. How many of you know he loves you? Go ahead and stand up on your feet with me this morning. Out off the cross, he loved enough to heal. Out of his pain, he loved enough to do it. Grandma. I know we've already prayed. Go ahead, fellas, if you'll bring my, put my thing up. Thank you, guys. Out of his pain, he loved. I think there's no greater thing we could do this morning. On this Easter Sunday, 2018, to make a commitment in our life. You know what? I'm going to walk in the love of God. I'm not going to walk in condemnation. I'm not going to walk in guilt. I'm not going to walk in guilt. I'm not going to let guilt hold me back and hold me down anymore. I'm going to love. I'm going to let God love me out of my good times, out of the sunshine, out of the rain, out of the joy, out of the pain. I'm going to love, Lord. And I'm going to receive the love of God into my life. Will you do that right now? Will you just say, Lord, I receive your love in my life right now. Come on. I receive your love. I believe your love. I receive your love. Lord, let me be a conduit of your love. Let me be someone who shares your love. We're going to go ahead and do our communion. If you'll get your essentials, we'll do this. The Bible said Jesus called the disciples together. It was the, the Feast of Pentecost. I mean, sorry, Passover. Feast of Passover. And he said, I've earnestly desired to eat this meal with you. I've earnestly desired to take this, this time with you. And he called them, met with them in the upper room, and he said, I'll no longer eat of this world, the bread and, the, and the, drink the cup from this world. He said, but what I want you to do is every time, and we do the communion, and, and I thank God for the communion, but I think what Jesus was going even beyond that point, every time you sit down to a meal, this do in remembrance of me. Somebody asked me, said, why, why don't we do communion anymore? Because I think it should be every time we sit at our table. Doesn't have to be unleavened bread and juice. Sit down to a Happy Meal. Sit down to a Whopper. Sit down to a fish. Whatever it is, you should sit down. That's when you should give thanks and do it in remembrance of him. God, I thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Then the Bible said he took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. Talking about loving out of your hurt. Sometimes blessing comes out of being broken. Sometimes the greatest lessons that we learn from God, we learn when we get broken. I heard someone say, you know, how, how can you be? They was asking, how can you be at the same church 35 years preaching that word? Does it ever get monotonous? No, I believe as long as you keep throwing the seed out, if the, if the ground ever gets broken, it'll fall in, its, it'll fall in and, and, and root. So you just keep pouring that seed on the hearts. Keep pouring that seed on the hearts. And if the heart ever gets broken, the seed's there to fall right in. Jesus took the bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. By his stripes, I am healed. Come on, say it with me. By his stripes, I am healed. Father God, I pray today as we take this bread together that you will heal. What the doctors cannot heal. What physicians, what medicine cannot fix. Your body was broken. You received the stripes for our healing. 
And God, God, I just claim my healing in the name of Jesus. Take and eat the bread. And then the Bible said he took the cup and said, this is my blood which was poured out for you. Lord, I thank you that you forgave me when I couldn't forgive myself. My past is gone. My future's bright. Come on, say that with me. My past is gone. My future's bright. Wash it away. Take away the sin. In Jesus' name, Lord, I receive your gift of forgiveness. Go ahead and drink the cup. Come on, somebody just start praising the Lord in this house. Come on, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You love me more than life. You love me so much, Jesus. You left heaven and came to earth and died on the cross for me. But you didn't just die. On the third day, you got up and came to life again. And we celebrate that today. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Happy Easter. Go love on somebody. Let them know you're glad to see them. We love you in the house. It's renewed, restored. Yeah. Say.